Hey everybody, welcome back, Devin Eugene Grognard, sitting back down here, taking a look at what we're probably going to get to the table next, World at War, Eisenbach Gap, and Death of the First Panzer, technically it's just the World at War series, lock and load, mm, excuse me, this is the original version, Mark Walker did 19, or no, 2007, it is platoon scale modern warfare 19 well 1985 that was what 30 years ago i still consider that modern warfare um this game this series i really really like i've always liked the world of war series it's a nice simple easy platoon level i mean it, it grocks right there for me i have probably played this system in the last 10 years, the Advanced Tobruk system I've played the most in the last 10 years. I've probably played this the second most uh, of all my gameplay in the last 10 years, this system. Um, I totally had something really poignant I was going to say and completely lost it. <laughs> Okay, so anyways, this game is not in my top five favorite games of all time. It is, however, in my top ten games, favorite, well, not games, but systems of all time. I enjoy Third World War. I enjoy Cold War Gone Hot. I enjoy Soviets and U.S. and Warsaw Pact and NATO bashing at each other. I'm a child of the 60s and 70s. I went into the military in the 80s. I was trained to fight the Soviets. The Cold War, that was my war. You know, that, that, that's, that's all there is to it. I enjoy Cold War Gone Hot scenarios. And this game, for what faults it does have, and there's not many faults, but they kind of are glaring and are easily open to abuse, it definitely scratches that platoon level itch. And there's not a lot of platoon level modern warfare games out there. Some people could say MBT, but I would put MBT as a tactical because it's individual tanks and uh squads it's not the platoon level so i i kind of really really like this system yeah i know i said that already okay so let's go over what is bad <laughs> about this game first off all right first off let's take a look at the setting mark walker made this uh as his third world war and he came up with the name Eisenbach Gap. There's no such place as Eisenbach Gap at all, period. It's 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 a made-up name. It's supposed to represent the Fulda Gap where the Soviets were, Soviets were expected to pour through with 11 divisions, uh, pour through the Fulda Gap, drive straight towards Frankfurt. Um, Mark Walker decided to kind of fictionalize the Third World War. He kind of took the real world, but then he kind of made a bunch of names up. I'm not really sure why he did that. I think part of the reason that he did it was so he didn't have to make really historically accurate maps. In the grand scheme of things, not that big of a deal. The maps are, and the, 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 the couple of dozen maps and, and all the expansions are representative of the areas you're, you're fighting in. This is kind of Western European... You know, this is supposed to be Eisenbach, which is supposed to be Fulda. And it, it, it represents the type of terrain, the area you're fighting pretty well. For And, for example, like in Blood and Bridges, which I believe was the French expansion, it had the maps were in there were, were you know, French countryside relative. The Israeli uh, expansion, you know, kind of the Golan Heights type terrain that you're going to find over in Israel, Palestine, Egypt. So there are a lot of people out there who have said, eh, it's not historically accurate. Eh, you know what? I really don't care. <laughs> this is a platoon level. I don't need it to be historically 100% accurate. I mean, all these names, as far as I can, I, there was at one point I went through and I did uh, did try to find if any of these were real names, but Bergenfell, that's not a real name. And I, if my German was, was stronger, I think there are a couple of... Uh, kind of joke names put in, but I, for the life of me, I can't remember because it's been so too long since I spoke German. Okay, so as the World of War, uh, World at War series expanded, Mark definitely went a little bit more off the scale, off the rails, and really started going 
kind of fictional. He started introducing vampires and werewolves, and the Pope declared another crusade, and it it kind of it, we got silly. <laughs> it really did kind of get silly. Well, recently Mark Walker has sold lock and load to the guy who runs Matrix Paradox, I believe. And if you've kind of noticed in the past couple of years, Lock and Load has kind of been revamping and redoing pretty much all of their game lines. Hey, Andrew, glad you can make it. Sorry, no Stellaris today. Sorry about that. Um, has kind of been uh, the, the biggest one. <laughs> What's up, Ron? Retro Sports Network. Yes, yeah, so somebody enjoyed the herbs a little too much. Well, I don't know about that. He just he just liked to go off the rail. But anyways, in the last couple of years, their 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 squad level, their tactical system, lock and load from lock and load publishing. Yeah, I never never got that either. Um, has completely re gone gone through. Well, not a complete revamp, but they've collected all the rule sets together, put out the big massive compendium. So all of lock and all the lock and load game systems have been kind of revamped, and they're in the process of revamping the world at war. Putting it in a more historically accurate setting, a Fulda Gap, Hoff Gap, you know, Northern Plains, all that stuff. The I've been seeing a lot of a lot of progress on it. The Kickstarter should be starting here sometime soon ish and they've already got the base game and like 12 expansions already planned out for it. Now's a good time if you want to get into a good platoon level action World War Three. Wait for the Kickstarter. I would be getting the Kickstarter. However, I just never have enough finances in my account to uh, cover it if and when the Kickstarter ever decides to drop. I don't have a credit card is what it is. Um, so, yeah, I, I have enjoyed this game so much in the last 10, 15 years. Probably one of the handful of box games I've actually ever purchased. So that's how kind of how much I enjoy this system. The non-historical accuracy aside, like I said, it's platoon level. You're only covering at most a couple kilometers of terrain. You don't need it to be 100% accurate. As long as it represents terrain that's in that area, I'm good with it. Rules of play. Uh, what is it? 14 pages, and most of these are scenarios. However, yeah, well, yeah, four pages of scenarios. The font is really, really tiny. The one thing I can't get over this game is the font is really, really, really tiny. I don't like how tiny the font is. My eyes have a hard time reading it. However, if you look down just through through sheer volume rule-wise, it's less than Panza Leader. You know, Arab-Israeli Wars. Not much to it. It uses a pretty cool chit pull system. And honestly, for the day, you know, 12, 13 years ago when this game came out, chit pull was kind of a unique, it wasn't a lot of games that used chit pull. So it's really good for a solitaire system because you're pulling the chits for unit or for unit activation. I mean, you never know what's coming up. So it's real easy to play uh, double blind and it's play against yourself. Another reason why I kind of really like it. Um, the counters, you know, your typical third world, what you would expect from a third world war, uh, tactical platoon level or 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 uh, strategic level armor piercing high explosive armor to hit and then you know movements and when the game first came out there were only a few units in the game so it was real easy to mark down if they could move fire helicopter line of sight i mean terrain chart it's pretty simple if you know basic basic uh line of sight and basic terrain effects from other games you're gonna have no problem falling into this game the upside and the downside to the chit pull system is since it's pulled by unit activation you kind of have these historical units and so you kind of have you know let's see if i can actually zoom in uh see this is some west german units let's see if i can find the find the uh actual command chit Actually, that won't have it because those are attached units. <laughs> All right, so yeah, like right here. Let's see if I can zoom in on this. Two 174 Panzer. So 2nd Battalion, 174th Panzer. And has little unit and has their unit marking on it. So focus. Ah, I'm not going to have a real hard, easy time focusing. And yeah, another, another drawback. Tiny little counters. Very hard for these old eyes to see. I think the Kickstarter is is going to have a bit bigger counters. God, I hope they're going to have bigger counters. Um, the upside is it's... Well, what is the upside to a chit pull in uniformations? I guess I can't... 
I guess there really isn't an upside. The downside is you got to always keep the formations separate from each other because the scenarios are usually take this formation and this formation and this formation. So you can't just take all your counters and throw them into a big pile like I've done with like, you know, like Panzer Leader, Panzer Blitz. And it's like in those games, it's like you need four Panthers and three infantry and two targets. Really easy to pull them. This one is you need these units from 2 slash 174 and these units from 1 slash 274. So it's a bit of a pain in the ass that way. But it is, it, 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 it does keep the counter count down a little bit. I think the base game... 136 counters, something like that. And that included the administrative counters. The one thing I don't like about the administrative counters is that there's never enough ops complete. Whenever you get done moving or firing a unit or anything, you put an ops complete marker on it, and there's just never enough ops complete markers. Maybe if I had a couple of the other box sets and had more administrative markers, it wouldn't be so much of an issue. And really, it's not that big of an issue unless you start playing bigger games. Most of the scenarios run you know, 10 to 15, 20 counters on the allied side and, you know, 20 to 30 counters on the on the Warsaw pack side. So not a lot of counters, really kind of small. Um, and the first, the first game, Eisenbach Gap, came with like eight scenarios and they were all played on one map. I, this was it, this, not geomorphic maps. I know we took a look at this before, but it's not a geomorphic map. So it's not like you can take other maps and kind of like how we had in Panzer Leader, Panzer Blitz, and Advanced uh, Squad Leader, Advanced Squad Leader. How they did the geomorphic boards where you could shape and shift the boards however you wanted to and they'd fit and, and line up. Good thing, because you don't have to try to tack that, track down 10,000 boards to play a scenario. Bad thing is, there's not a lot of variety in, in the battle. It's like, all right, we got eight scenarios. How can we mix it up a little bit? Have one attack scenario attack from this side and this side, and one scenario from this side. And one, you know, So you kind of run out of uh, scenario setups after a while. Death of the First Panzer was the first expansion that came out. And honestly, it's the only other expansion for this game I have. I just have never had the finances to pick up any more of the games. Not sure. I could probably pick up a bunch of them now for on the cheap because they are re-releasing this. But this was released as a folio. I think it was like 20 bucks. Came with six scenarios, 50 new counters, and one four-color map. And I always thought this was the coolest thing. The folio itself, the inside, was the map. I thought this was one of the coolest things I'd ever seen. I wish more game companies would do this. I mean, like I said, it was 20 bucks. It was cheap. Yeah, only six scenarios. Some of the scenarios use the Eisenbach Gap map. Some of the scenarios use the Death of the First Panzer map. And it just I wish more companies would do smaller-like expansions like this. Again, for us poor ass motherfuckers out here that don't have a lot of money to spend, you know, 60 bucks on a box set, you know, 20 bucks on an expansion to get a few more scenarios and a few more counters. That's eh, kind of a cool thing. You know, the death of the first Panzer, it's what, eight pages, six pages? Yeah, six pages. And, you know, pretty much all those are scenarios, a little bit up, uh, quick rule snippets. Optional victory point scoring, updated order of battle. So, you know, for example, uh, you have first, second, third, or first 171st, first 172nd, second 174th, third 174th. So you got four platoons in there, which is, you know, a reinforced company, plus attached units of a Pa, Luch, uh, Milan, Red Eye, Gepard, Roland, Jagdpanzer, and Jagdpanzer 4 5. Uh, I think it also came, yeah, so it came with a, a Soviet anti tank guns which uh, were towed artillery. Well, not really artillery, but towed anti-tank guns like they used in World War II. So, yeah. That's World at War. Block and loads, platoon level combat game system. Probably going to be getting to this to the table. Uh, well, I'm going to be starting setting it up probably today or tomorrow. Probably get to recording it next week. I know it's been a while since I've actually done Hex Encounter on the tabletop. I've been doing a lot of computer and doing a lot of uh, sports gaming, uh, which isn't a bad thing. I just kind of remember I got to get back to my roots and <laughs> get back to the Hex Encounter stuff. The scenario we're probably going to be doing is from Death of the First Panzer. So, you know, scenario three, Whitman's Ghost, just because it's a cool sound. <laughs> Panzer Grenadier and three 174 Panzer, which is what two platoons of uh, of uh, uh, West Germans, and then the Soviet forces are. Let's see, got a 
company of attached armor and a company of airborne. So nice little small scenario, no more than like 25 counters on each side and uses the uh, Death of the First Panzer map. So I just wanted to get this out real quick. C kind of a couple reasons I wanted to do it. One reason I wanted to, uh, I needed, I could have recorded this and just posted it later, but I also kind of wanted to test out my uh, streaming on the, uh, on the using my cell phone. Last couple times I streamed with it, it, it ended up being 720 resolution. I really wasn't happy with that. I could have swore I set it higher. So I spent like three hours doing web search to try to increase my streaming. It's like, how to stream? No, I know how to stream to my phone. I want to know how to increase the DPI streaming from my phone. You know how hard it is to try to find articles on that when it says streaming, YouTube, phone, and it just gives you how to stream to your phone. I don't need that at all anyways that's what i got it's a friday i wonder if i should do anything i think ron over at uh retro sports network's doing a chat tonight and i'm pretty sure al and i and ron are going to be doing a sports chat uh or just our general pop culture chat tomorrow night i think that's all i got oh andrew you are most welcome i wish i could do more of these i'm glad you could pop in uh, so yeah that's all i got Hopefully we'll get some gameplay. I probably won't stream the gameplay. I'll just record it and then post it later. And yeah, no, I'm talking with my with my hands. I don't want to switch the phone around. Yeah. Anyways, questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms in the comment section. I'll see everybody next time. See ya.